In recent years, there have been few intradivisional rivalries that can match the spirit, intensity, or drama of the series between the New England Patriots and the Baltimore Colts. It is a very special game, no matter where the teams are in the standings. The rumors of a possible evacuation from Crab Cake Corners hadn't been the only thing occupying Coach Ted March of Broda's team. The arrival of the first place Patriots, fresh off a convincing win over Miami, posed a definite threat to Baltimore's modest two-game winning streak. But with a relatively healthy Burt Jones returning at quarterback, the Colts felt they had a chance to pull off an upset. And as past history had shown, anything can happen when Baltimore and New England play each other. This 1979 version would more than live up to that tradition. Prior to coming into this game, only one other team in pro football had scored more points than the New England Patriots. And quarterback Steve Grogan wanted something on the board on their very first drive. Unfortunately for New England, their best laid plans went astray. The turnover put the Colts in excellent field position and they wasted no time in capitalizing. Number 20, Joe Washington, was the most anxious of all, proving it with perhaps the finest individual effort of the 1979 NFL season. In three pro campaigns, Joe had never scored a touchdown on the ground. This one is worth repeating. By all rights, the hit by number 50, Sam Hunt, should have stopped Washington. But somehow, Joe the Jet kept his balance and completed a run that can best be characterized as amazing. This early score established a trend that would continue throughout the game. Fur Jones would involve his running backs heavily in the offensive scheme, particularly with medium-range passes. Jones was able to use runners like number 23, halfback Don McCauley, who would then turn the short pass into something far greater. Much to Baltimore's dismay, a penalty negated this particular play, but it proved the strategy was sound and the Colts would return to it later. Meanwhile, the Patriots were anxious to bounce back from their early woes and did so when Grogan went airborne to wide receiver Stanley Morgan, number 86. The 56-yard play brought the score to 7-6 to and it stayed that way when the point after was missed. Ben Jones and the Colts were quick to respond. The recently recovered quarterback scrambled well enough and long enough to find number 35, Glenn Dowdy, open downfield. After Dowdy's 54-yard effort, it took the Colts only three plays to score again. This time, fullback Don Hardiman, number 36, did the honors. The upstart Colts now enjoyed a surprising 14-6 advantage over the Patriots. Yet in the game that had several trends, another was becoming evident. When one team scored, the other would storm right back. Within three minutes after the first touchdown, Brogan went to Stanley Morgan again. And again, the results were the same. The first quarter ended with the Colts ahead 14 to 13, but that was a situation Grogan wished to remedy with all deliberate speed. He began the second period by going deep to Morgan again. Only an alert play from safety Nesby Glasgow, number 25, prevented the long completion.
Despite the near miss, Grogan would go to Morgan again throughout the afternoon. For now, though, the Patriots were unable to move. So Jones and company began a march of their own. The best catch of the drive, and perhaps of the whole day, came from reserve tight end Mac Alston, number 83. A man known more for his blocking capabilities than his receiving skill. Drive ended with a cold field goal, extending their lead to 17 to 13. The Patriots would do no more scoring in the first half, and the Colts were stopped from doing any further damage when Jones' late pass attempt was stolen by number 40, cornerback Mike Haynes. Mac Alston's jackknife tackle did not sit well with the Patriots, who weren't all that happy about trailing at halftime anyway. But no one really seemed all that surprised about it. It was shaping up to be another typical New England-Baltimore battle, and an explosive second half was still to come. Indeed, there are quarterbacks in the NFL who can throw a ball farther than Burt Jones. There are many who stand behind center who may be wiser as well. However, number seven is beyond comparison when it comes to competitive spirit. Behind their leader, the inspired Colts march for a touchdown on their first possession of the second half. On the drive, Jones used his backs masterfully. Number 36, Don Hardiman, was one effective weapon, as was number 23, Don McCauley. From the Patriots' seven, Jones found another backfield mate, Joe Washington, for the score. Washington's second score of the day padded the Colts' tenuous four-point lead. But against the second-leading scorers in the AFC, the New England Patriots, no lead is ever secure, as Baltimore was soon to find out. Rookie Colt cornerback Larry Brazil, number 47, allowed New England to sustain a downfield campaign by plowing into Patriot punter Eddie Hare midway through the third quarter. Brazil's case of rookie over-exuberance resulted in a roughing the punter penalty. Steve Grogan then quickly rekindled the Patriot attack. Such catches for big gains are nothing new to veteran Harold Jackson, the highest paid wide receiver in the NFL. The Patriots would be denied a touchdown as Mike Ozdowski, number 51, steamed in on Grogan. His sack forced New England to settle for three, making the score 24 to 16, Baltimore. Still, the Colts seem bent on making crucial second half mistakes. Such was the case when John Smith kicked off for the Patriots. Bob Kreider's recovery of Baltimore's latest gift opened the door for Grogan. With his receivers covered, Steve was forced to run the football, something he relishes rather than fears. Undoubtedly, Grogan's the finest running quarterback in the league today. He is cunning and wiry and possesses excellent peripheral vision, making him a natural open field runner. Perhaps someday they'll release a film concerning his running ability entitled Grogan's Run. But for now, Steve was thinking of six points instead of stardom. Harold Jackson's touchdown grab was nullified by a costly Patriot holding penalty. 
On third and ten from the cold 11, Grogan was pummeled by Baltimore's leading sacker, defensive end Fred Cook, number 72. Cook's three sacks last week against Buffalo aided Baltimore in its second win of 1979. This one forced New England to settle for three once more as things tightened up late in the third quarter. When Baltimore took over, Jones resorted to the tactics he had found previously successful, passing to his backs with short swing passes. Quick releases to McCauley seem the perfect attack against the New England defense that is the NFL's toughest to run through and pass over. When the Patriot linebackers began picking up Jones' backs in the flat, Bird rendered his Steve Grogan imitation and ran the ball himself. Jones ignored his nagging shoulder separation and the punishing Patriot linebackers and cruised out of bounds into the arms of teammate Fred Cook for a 25-yard pickup. Jones knew a faster and safer way to six points. Speedy wide receiver Roger Carr, number 81. Feeling that he was tripped and deserving of a pass interference call, Carr exhibited the type of fury that Jones is noted for. Nevertheless, his rage would be in vain as the Colt downfield drive was halted. Rogan went to work to take the lead. Harold Jackson would finish the day with nearly 100 yards on merely four catches. His latest grab set up a Grogan touchdown run. The second half had become a duel between quarterbacks. With seven minutes remaining in the game, Grogan had the upper hand. Jones went about the business of changing all that by returning to Don McCauley. McCauley's twisting 16-yard gain took Baltimore deep into Patriot territory and set the scene for Joe Washington's second rushing touchdown of his career and the game. As little Joe had personally ruined New England last year on national television, so had he accounted for three touchdowns in this contest as well. One can't blame the little guy if his head would momentarily outgrow his helmet. Ahead 31 to 26, Jones sought to run out the clock by handing off to workhorse Don McCauley. But number 40 All-Pro Mike Haynes stripped McCauley of the ball. Haynes provided the Patriots with an opportunity to overcome their five-point deficit with over three minutes to play. Rogan went to the receiver who had tormented Baltimore all day, Harold Jackson. Once again, an excellent defensive play would prohibit New England from scoring. Underrated strong safety Bruce Laird, number 40, was the latest Baltimore hero. The Patriots still had one final chance to achieve a dramatic victory, and Burt Jones elected not to view the game's final moments. In a do-or-die situation, Grogan had his pass deflected by number 56, Ed Simonini, as number 51, Mike Ozdowski, drove him to the turf, 
causing his pass to fall harmlessly to the ground. A game that was predicted to be a one-sided New England conquest proved to be an evenly waged, dramatic football game. From the Cole Patriot showdowns of the past, one must wonder how these teams managed to consistently play such stirring emotional football. An explanation for Baltimore's victory was perhaps best offered by a character in the novel Semi-Tough, who stated, winning is a happy accident of getting a bunch of guys together who want to. For New England head coach Ron Earhart, he has only two weeks to overcome defeat and prepare for what will probably be another cardiac rematch.